Hey, welcome to What's Happening Now on KBLKRadio.com, and thank you for tuning in. This morning, we have a good one for you. We have, um, we're going to be talking about finding solutions for a traumatized community affected by group violence and death. And we have as our guest this morning, we have Miss um, Tasha Williamson, Miss Tracy Swafford, and Dr. Heather Alesh. Mm-hmm. All right. And, I, and so we're going to uh, get into that in a moment, but I want to, like, first give a little commentary and um, share some things with you about a gentle answer, being kind. And so uh, uh, what I'm looking at is in the Bible, the book of Proverbs, chapter 15 and verse 1, where it says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And I find some people that I encounter need to work on their people skills. They don't know how to talk to you, and all they offer you are harsh words, and that 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 stirs up anger. So, when you look at this verse uh, that I just quoted in um, fifteen Proverbs fifteen and one, uh, King Solomon, through the wisdom of God, is trying to tell us that kindness will often neutralize the fiercest. Where positive derangement has not taken place, one angry word will always beget another. For the disposition of one spirit always begets its own likeness in another. Thus, kindness produces kindness, and rage produces rage, aggression produces aggression. Uh, Universal experience confirms this proverb. So, to be able to be kind and gentle it takes humility, and, and I know I wrestle a lot of times with that because I, I have to ask myself many times, are you being prideful? You know, step back, humble yourself, be a little bit more kinder, don't rush out and, you know, jump to things. So whenever I sense in my spirit I'm getting angry or stubborn, I have to ask myself, am I full of pride? The Bible says in Proverbs sixteen eighteen, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. And that's the World English Bible. This scripture lets me know one thing. If my anger stems from pride and I act on it, that anger will place me on a path of shame and ruin. That is why the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 through 27, and I quote, When you are angry, do not sin, and be sure to stop being angry before the end of the day. Don't give the devil a way to defeat you. And a lot of times we don't look at the spiritual aspect of what we're dealing with in many times, especially the work we do in our community and, and those of us that are spiritual and are, um, you know, uh, uh, serving the Lord and a people of faith. Many times we, we, we can dive into things and just look at people, look at circumstances, look at situations from the natural realm and from a natural perspective versus looking at it that there are some spiritual evil forces behind it. And a lot of times, you know, we can't, I mean, you, we hold people accountable, but we just can't look at that individual. We have to look at the spirit that is behind that individual because sometimes it may be a devil or, or I should say a demon or an evil spirit that's working through or in that person to distract you and pull you away from what God has called and assigned you to do. So we have to stay focused. We have to stay prayed up. And we have to keep a spiritual mind in what we're doing or it will become very easy to be distracted and pulled in another direction. So here's what I have to say. At the end of the day, I must surrender to God and be kind. However, don't mistake my kindness for my weakness, which means just because I'm kind doesn't mean you can assume that I'm weak and and then think you can take advantage of me. You may get away with taking advantage of me once, but you will never get a second chance. Like they say, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So I'm not going to give you a second chance. <laughs> so even if you 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 don't <clears throat> even if you don't leave me alone, guess what? I'm going to love you anyhow. So What is my point? Leave me alone and let me do God's work. And when you interfere with that, you are being used by the devil. It's spiritual. It's spiritual. So God's love uh, uh, is unanswering, uh, unswavering, excuse me, in purpose.
purpose. And that's one of the things we have to understand is that this work we do, we do for the love of God and in the love of God. You know, if we don't do it through love, the enemy will conquer us. He will beat us down and he will divide us and he will cause all type of animosity and problems in the community and the work that we're trying to do. So here's one thing. When you look at God's love, God's love is loyal. It is fixed. It is firm and unchanging. When you talk about his love, no matter who you are or what you do, understand that God loves you. Yes, he calls for us to repent or change our attitude and do right before he can offer us that forgiveness. But his love is always there. That's why it says, the Bible says, it isn't God's will that any should perish, but that also has come to repentance. So he's being patient with us because he loved us. He loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. And, and here's the key that I think some people don't understand. Uh, he says, whosoever believes. And so that means that I, it can be the serial killer that is in prison doing life. God loves him and is waiting on him to repent. And if he stopped right in his tracks and turned, God will forgive him and allow him a place in the kingdom. I once had a friend that was in prison doing time and he was serving God. But then he got discouraged because he saw a guy who was this, this, the, he thought was a horrible person that should not receive any kind of forgiveness. And when that person turned to God, he gave up on God because he didn't think that that person should get a chance to serve the Lord. But you must understand no matter how horrible a person is, we have to love them. And we have to give them opportunities. And in the meantime, we have to be patient. And sometimes that's the problem in our community and among us is that we're not patient with people. And we run out of patience and therefore we give up on folks. But God's love never do that. Now, people's love will change on you like shifting shadows. People will turn on you, hate you, talk about you, reject you, walk out on you, mistreat you, break your heart, neglect you, and use you. But guess what, well, guess what I have to say about that? Keep on loving them anyway, okay? Don't give up on God, your relationship, your children, yourself, your dreams, or uh, 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 your relationships with others, your, your goals. It is really unacceptable when love fades away like morning dew and when the sun rises. It is a tragedy when people succumb to the pressures of life. Don't let that happen to you. It is a wave of anguish and sorrow when people give up on their dreams, their lives, their relationships, their children, their parents, and their careers. When you have love deep in your heart, giving up is never an option. Now, let me say a word about the recent homicides in San Diego uh, that has taken place in our community. And um, uh, one was Darren White. Another was Tremaine Jones. And uh, this happened on Wednesday, Thursday, and then last night. We had a couple more shootings, you know, where individuals were injured and one was seriously injured. And this, unless the community, community come together, we have to get out of ourselves. We have to see the bigger picture. It's not just about you. It's not just about your circle, but it's about a community that is being affected. And we have to come together and, and respond to each of these uh, violent acts separately because the, the one violent act that maybe what happened with Darian on Wednesday can traumatize over 200 people. But then not only that, but the, the second thing that can happen is it can lead to more violence. Then you can end up having five, six other people killed and shot and, and, and more and more people traumatized and a community in uproar. And then you lose folks to prison. And so we don't think about that. We just get caught up in our little circle, our little world, and not thinking about how this one act of violence can mess up a whole community. So I'm calling for you to get out of yourself, calling for you to think beyond your own small little world and think outside the box and look at the bigger picture because it's about a community and not just about you, okay? So um, I want to move on here and um, get into our guests, and we have a few minutes before our break, and so we're going to, um, I want to introduce a couple of folks here and bring them into our discussion here. Um, we have Tasha Williamson. She's the co-founder of the San Diego Compassion Project, and she's all, I, you know, I, I kind of, even though she called us the co-founders of CAS, Community Citizen Support Team, she's also, she's right there with us, working along, helping us we, in the background, doing all the work and stuff. And so uh, she's with us today. Uh, uh, good morning, and welcome to What's Happening Now. 
Good morning. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. All right. And then our next guest we have is Tracy Swafford. Amen. So Tracy Swafford is, she's a volunteer in all areas, but the San Diego Compassion Project is where I came to know her. And she's a parent. She's an activist. She's involved. Uh, a lot of people in the community love her and respect her. And she does a lot in the community. So we, and she really helps us in the work that we're doing. And, and she's faced it from all ends. She's lost her daughter through violence. She has sons that have been to prison and caught up in, in the street lifestyle and so on. And so, you know, she has a perspective to bring here to the table that uh, uh, may be like yours, or she can share some light on what you're going through to help you get through what you're going through. And then also we have uh, Dr. Heather Ailish. And now the thing that I like about her is that, you know, she's, she's you know, um, uh, come from the clinical perspective. A lot of times you meet people that uh, are doctors and clinical and, and counselors and psychologists and so on. When it comes to our community, the, the, the people of color community, and dealing with folks, especially from a violent perspective, uh, they're afraid to deal with that. But she's not. She dives right in there and deal with it. When there was shooting, she got out on the streets and knocked on doors with us, helped us to uh, reach out to uh, the community that's been affected by this violence. And she understands the trauma uh, that folks are going through. So uh, we're going to get a good pers uh, perspective from her also. And so I, I've, I've kind of summarized it a little bit about my guest this morning. But I want them to tell us in their own words, each of them tell us in their own words about uh, your, the community programs that you're involved in and why. So we'll begin with Tasha and then we'll come on down. <laughs> yes, yeah, so um, San Diego Compassion Project, of course, I got involved um, when uh, Monique Palmer and Michael Taylor Jr. Um, were murdered. I knew Monique because she went to high school with my boys, uh, Jabril and Khalil. And uh, the involvement, you know, at first I worked at Jacob Center. We were doing uh, Project Safeway where we stood on the corners monitoring kids. And it was just natural for us to reach out to Denise, uh, Michael's mom, and Tracy, uh, Monique's mom, and, the, and their extended families um, to make sure that they had the things that they needed and just know that they weren't alone. Um, you know, I'm a mother as well of four kids, and, you know, I have, you know, as maybe many of us, there's always one, <laughs> maybe two, <laughs> like, but each kid, each kid is, is very different and, and unique, uh, and, you know, you have kids that get into more things than, than the other kids, even mm -hmm. though they're raised by the same parent, mm -hmm. um, you know, they have uh, different peers and different uh you know, different things that they uh, surround, environments that they surround themselves around. So uh, I got into this work uh, because of my children, mm -hmm. um, because I wanted to have a different world for my children um, to grow up in, and I wanted uh, a different environment mm -hmm. than what I grew up in in South Central Los Angeles mm -hmm. and their father in Compton. So um, just wanted to make the world a better place mm -hmm. um, for generations to come, and, and this is how I'm able to do it and give back and make sure people can access services and know that that they have people out there that care about them. How far do you live from Compton? You said um my kid's father grew up in Compton okay. so his family okay. is um is out there. Oh, okay. So and Compton is probably about 20 minutes away from um 15 20 minutes away from where I grew up but I grew up in the heart of the the rolling 60s on 63rd and Crenshaw. Okay. Um, yeah, back in my days when I used to get a bang, we saw here about the rolling sixties <laughs> in LA. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was <laughs> a good group. So hey, uh, 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 we're gonna we're gonna take a break, and then when we come back, we're going to uh, uh, have a, a introduction of of the of our rest of our guests, their programs, and what they're doing and why they're involved. So stay tuned. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. God bless you. Thank you for staying with us. This is your host, Bishop Bowder, on What's Happening Now on KBLKRadio.com. And we're right in the midst of uh, uh, our guests giving um, a little preview of, of their community programs and why they're involved. And uh, Tasha Williams just shared with us why uh, her Bowder program and why she's involved in it. And so we want to move on to uh, Miss Tra Tracy Swafford. And, uh, you know, I know you volunteering with several things, and but I met you through the San Diego Compassion Project. And, uh, you know, share with us about why uh, the, the program you're involved in, which Tasha just did, and why you're involved in it. So the why might be more so than, than the what. <laughs> uh, my name is Tracy Swafford, and uh, 
I'm blessed to be here, but I'm also participating in San Diego Compassion Project. My daughter Monique was killed in 08 in a drive-by shooting. Mm -hmm. So once I got myself together, mm -hmm. I started participating in volunteer. San Diego Food Passion Project. Volunteering is like my passion. Amen. I told somebody when I was serving at a repassing that if Monique had told me he was going to be doing this, I was like, you must be crazy. <laughs> I am not going to be doing this. But look where I'm at now, and it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. so it's all to the good. But uh, I volunteer with San Diego Food Passion Project. I'm a um, volunteer at Lincoln High School because I have two kids go to Lincoln. I'm also a um, business manager and a team mom for um, Pop Warner football. But this year my son's going to, over to AYF. So I do that and just a lot of giving back in the community. And um, I'm part of um, Project Keel, which is one of, I started the program with uh, Denise Saunders. And I'm also part of Mothers with a Message. Mm -hmm. With Bevel and Bravo. You said Project, what is it called? Um, Project Hill. Kill? How do you say that? Hill. 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 Oh, Project Hill. Hill. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, I heard mm -hmm. that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Dr. He Heather Elish. <laughs> uh, I believe I'm saying, pronouncing the last name right? Or, Close. Uh, Elish, like relish. Elish. Elish. Yeah. Elish. Okay. <laughs> Elish. 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 Okay. Elish. All right. All right. <laughs> 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 so tell us uh, about what you do and why you do it. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me here. Right. I'm honored to be a part of this panel. Um, I currently work with UPAC. I work for the Alliance for Community Empowerment, mm -hmm. and our program is a grant-funded program with a focus on prevention and early intervention mm -hmm. when it comes to gang-involved youth and their families. And um, a big part of what we do is mobile response to um, acts of violence in the community. Mm -hmm. Um, in order to be there to support the families of the victims mm -hmm. and um, really kind of be there for the community, boots on the ground type work right, is, right. is really a big focus. And for me, I am the clinician on the team, mm -hmm. um, so I, I get to provide the therapeutic services to the families and friends that are affected by our community violence um, and anyone, really, that is affected by the community violence. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a, a really have a strong passion for working with youth that are um, maybe considering getting involved in gangs or mm -hmm. um, starting to have some involvement in the justice system, um, just based on my own past and right. how I grew up. That right. those, those youth I'm pretty passionate about working with. So I'm also part of the community wraparound program and working with youth on probation and mentoring those youth. Wow, wow. So you dealt with a lot. One of the things you didn't share with us uh, that I think folks need to know is um, uh, the prison. You know, you yeah. with the, you did some work in prisons, right? I did. I worked at uh, Salinas Valley State Prison for about 10 months, and then I went on to work in Calipatria and then Donovan mm -hmm. um, as a therapist, providing supports to the inmates and some of the inmates, particularly in ADSEG, who mm -hmm. are really, um, really having a hard time. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what was that experience like? Um, I really, it really gave me a lot of respect for, um, how difficult that mm -hmm. is to be mm -hmm. in prison and how separated an individual begins to feel mm -hmm. from the whole world and, and their family. And a lot of those guys, you know, in, in my experience, good people make horrible mistakes. Right, right. And, um, a lot of those guys really just needed support and love and a reminder that you're still human and and you you can make change if you have that support. So right. that was something that I really enjoyed, and I felt like I learned more from them mm -hmm. <laughs> than anything. So. Right, right. You know, and that's that's one of the you know things I think we you know folks need to understand, and and we need to have more conversation about is you know uh, good people make bad mistakes, make bad choices many times, and good people get caught up. And horrible things, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I, I like to look at, even though I know, you know, from a spiritual perspective, we know no one is good except God. But from the perspective of being a, a, a decent human being, mm -hmm. you know, uh, someone who, you know, uh, you could look at and say, man, this person is not evil. Like, you know, yeah. we we paint the picture of them trying to be, you know. And because you know the lifestyle that I live, you know, being involved in gangs and drugs and, and crime, robberies and thieving, running the streets every day um, and living that violent life that I lived, you know, uh, 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 getting out of it. And I look back now, you know, 
I see a lot of a lot of people that I know are some are dead and some are in prison for the rest of their lives. But like you said, these these were folks that were pretty decent and good, but just made some bad choices mm -hmm. in life. It, it's not that they were um, uh, just utterly uh, no good for anything. You know the way we try to describe a community, and I know like with uh, the dub vigils that we have, that's one of the things that we try to do is to get folks to understand that the person that just died through Violent Act, a lot of times if they, they want to say it's gang-related or they want to look at our community, and if it happened in our community, or if the person is black or brown or something like that, and it's all, you know, they probably got what they deserve, probably out there banging or selling drugs or, or something like that. They were a horrible person. And I think that that's the wrong approach to, uh, to look at because we don't look at all the underlining issues uh, that is going on. And I know one of those issues is is uh, the poverty that is in our community, uh, the lack of opportunity that is in our community, and, you know, and, and, and all of us are parents, and so no disrespect parents because all of us are parents, but sometimes even the parents fail to, to be there for their child and to offer the love that they need, uh, and so they go get caught up. In something else. It's not always the case because, you know, I, I know I try to do everything I could for my kids. And then when I was working with uh, folks in the community, I uh, began to see kids, how they were caught up. And I used to go home and, and try to do extra, you know, to make sure my kids wouldn't get caught up. But because of, of the, the environment in the community, when they go to school, when they go to the rec center and different places like that, it's all about the choices that they make. And like Tasha said, you know, you can, you can have a, a, a parent that is good, but you can have kids that just get caught up in the wrong people and just don't make healthy choices. Mm -hmm. And I know that, um, uh, you know, with me coming up as a parent, I used to tell my wife all the time and she would... She would say, no, and I said, we're, we're dysfunctional, you know, we're failing, you know, because the kids, I raised five boys and two girls. <laughs> some of them were okay, some of them weren't, some of them dropped out of high school, and some of them graduated out of high school. So it was all over the place, and when you look at other parents and look like all the kids are doing well, like, man, what's wrong with us? <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, the question I want to ask, ask you, you all and want to get into some of the trauma that we deal with and, and whatever else, you know, you might think that need to be added to that. But when we when we uh, look at our community, one of the things is is that um, uh, we face a lot of trauma. Uh, and and Doctor, we'll begin with you because I, I know you can define for us trauma and why it's important to address and treat those that are affected by trauma. Yeah. So uh, trauma is really any adverse experience that an individual or group experiences, and trauma is something that. We might not consciously be aware mm -hmm. that it's a trauma, mm -hmm. uh, but our body experiences that trauma. So really, it can be anything from just hearing sirens. Mm -hmm. Every time the body hears sirens, it has a reaction. Right. Something's wrong, mm -hmm. and our body begins to feel that and begins to hold that. Mm -hmm. So some individuals experience just a few traumas, and other individuals who live in communities where there just is mm -hmm. more trauma occurring are going to experience more of those traumas. So it becomes this complex, one on top of the other, additive effect inside our bodies. Mm -hmm. And we just begin to, if we experience a lot of traumas in a lifetime, especially yeah. in early childhood, it begins to build up on us. Mm -hmm. And we're more likely to be in this constant state of fight or flight. Wow. Yeah. Where our body is just ready to react quickly all the time. Mm -hmm. And it really creates uh, a lot of difficulties for individuals to be able to sit still and focus and and uh, interact in a calm way when, when they become triggered mm -hmm. because we have this, this history now that we've experienced all these traumas. Mm -hmm. And this is systemic and it's long term and it can be come on from generation to generation mm -hmm. um, trauma that we've experienced that our family kind of passes down to us. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but that doesn't mean there's no hope. Right. It just <laughs> means that it's important to be aware so that we can build resiliency um, in individuals who experience more trauma. Wow, wow, wow. And, you know, and, and that's amazing because I know that even with myself, you know, I, I knew nothing. I didn't even know what the word trauma or post-traumatic stress disorder meant. You know, I didn't know nothing about it, especially when I was out there. And even after I got out of the game, was in church for a few years, I became a, a business agent for a union, you know, representing folks that had a contract, you know, making sure that the contract was enforced and organizing uh, these, uh, my, the workers. And um, one lady I remember I was representing, she was raped, and um, she got fired because she, you know, was coming late. 
couldn't perform well on the job, and the doctor had said she was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And that was the first time I ever heard of that. And so mm -hmm. I had to represent an arbitration, and so I went uh, to the library and began to research and look it up. And as I began to look at some of the symptoms and some of the things that people experience the trump of the post-traumatic stress disorder i'm like wow that's what i'm experiencing you know i thought it was just a normal thing but it it, it wasn't you know and so uh tasha uh i know that you know with with the compassion project and cast uh and uh, the work that you do and have been doing for years in the community you deal with a lot of trauma in the community and um, uh, the, the, the folks that, that are affected by the trauma, I know many times they don't realize what they're going through and so on. But how do, through the organization that you're a part of, how, what, why is it important to address that trauma and how do we address it? Well, one, I, I think that all of us are, are traumatized. Mm -hmm. um, we either carry it vicariously or, or we've been, been traumatized. Um, by events mm -hmm. um, that, and sometimes we have complex traumas, which you know we have multiple traumas one after the other, yes. um, or multiple events that have happened to traumatize us. Mm -hmm. um, for me, one of the things that I notice in our community, black, brown, sometimes even mm -hmm. white, yes. um, and and other races, Asians. Somalian, mm -hmm. Asians, mm -hmm. everybody say I'm good. You ask them, <laughs> how, you okay? You know, how are you feeling? That's I'm right. good. I'm uh -huh. good. And I tell people, stop saying that, mm -hmm. cause you're not. Right. Right. You're not good. It's that's a. It, it, I think it's a natural reaction in our community mm -hmm. to say I'm good, cause in our community we grew up where nothing is supposed to hurt us. Mm -hmm. Nothing. We're not supposed to show that that right. the impacts right um and i think that we need to change that because us not showing the impacts has caused generations of impacts mm -hmm. that have gotten worse got you, got um, you. so we've handed down this trauma mm -hmm. and not dealing with it appropriately to generations of children wow. and they it has worsened the conditions in our communities mm -hmm. in our homes in our schools and how people access or don't access the services that are available right yeah um you know growing up and you, you know whatever happens in my house stays in my house mm -hmm. you know that child or that family carries that mm -hmm. for generations. Yes, absolutely. And it happens, and then you want to know why someone commits suicide, right. why someone's doing drugs, why somebody's doing this, because they have no outlet right. within their own safe base, right. which is the family. Right. Um, and we have to provide outlets. Um, one of the things I was looking for that I had posted on my Facebook um, mm -hmm. page, it was an African um, saying mm -hmm. um, because in Africa, in some places in Africa, they have forgiveness tribes. Okay. Um, where they uh, actually hold village type trials um, of people who have harmed um, people. Folks people who have harmed other folks and they mm -hmm. bring the folks they've harmed together. Okay. Um, sort of like the restorative right, stuff that's we what do I was thinking. with yeah. the National Conflict Resolution Center. Uh -huh. But it says Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. We are all connected. What hurts you hurts me. What mm -hmm. affects you affects me. Affects everyone. Mm -hmm. Human kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. Amen. Um, that's right. And we need to understand that you you talked about the the shoot the violence that has occurred. Mm -hmm. um, we have over 145 families. You guys have mm -hmm. over 80 85 families mm -hmm. that you've worked with in the years that we've right. been in existence. Right. And those people um, are impacted, and we mu multiply at times two you know 200 mm -hmm. per incident. Mm -hmm. um, that's the number that you get multiplied by the number of people, the number of victims. Right that we've serviced. So you look at that and, and that's an that's a crazy number. <laughs> yes it is. You know that's a crazy number. Yes, I remember in twenty thirteen we had sixteen thousand people impacted by violence wow. just in Southeast. Wow. Wow. And no, and we didn't have near enough services. We right. got more liquor stores, we got more marijuana shops, right. we got more unhealthy grocery stores yes. than we do services and supports right. in our community. Right. And I really think that that stuff needs to change. Mm -hmm. If we want to change how people interact with one another, mm -hmm. how people survive flight or fight mm -hmm. um, modes, then we have to provide them the services that they actually need. Right. Jobs, mm -hmm. housing, transportation, mm -hmm. uh, mental health. Mm -hmm. You know, everything that I'm going to now mm -hmm. 
it's a mental health breakdown. Right. Right. Everything. Right. If we had mental health, I mean, Harmonious Solutions closed down. Mm-hmm. We needed Harmonious Solutions That's here. Right. You know, right. we need mental health uh, facilities mm-hmm. or or grassroots like we need liquor stores. Right. And and weed shops. Yeah, yeah. We need them to be everywhere in the community so somebody could just walk in and say, you know, I'm not good. Exactly. 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 <laughs> I just need somebody to talk to for thirty minutes. Mm-hmm. Can I come back next week? <laughs> you know, those things and I think people don't think about that. People, you know, one of to me and I talk about this all the time, mm-hmm. one of the greatest um American atrocities mm-hmm. is poverty. Yes, yes, um, yes, yes. You know, Poverty, you know, we look at slavery, we look at all the violence that Mm -hmm. has happened in America, but the people that are the poorest Mm -hmm. are the people that are most impacted. Right, right. The people who have poor education, Mm -hmm. lack of services, that their needs aren't met, Mm -hmm. um, and it goes on for generation after generation. And it's not by accident, it's designed that way. Mm -hmm. Systemic and structural racism that we deal with is designed that way. Mm -hmm. And when you look at history, you'll see that. Now, Tracy, uh, you know, when, when we talk about, you know, trauma and how it affects our community and, and getting support and help for that, you actually, I mean, like, I, I appreciate what Tasha said because all of us have in some form, shape, or way, some kind of way. But I, I know that you face that ultimate, you know, trauma and, and nightmare and, and something that no parent want to hear and no parent want to go through. And um, um, as we heard Dr. Heather and, and Tasha uh, talk about the trauma and how it affects community, affects people, you actually went through that. And so the question that I have for you in regards to trauma, uh, when did, because uh, uh, as, as Dr. Heather said, you know, it's fight or flight, you know, in, in, when we deal with that. Did, did you, like, see, uh, did you, when you experienced the trauma that you went through, when was it that you kind of looked and saw that you were traumatized and needed help, or did you ever see that? Or I was, I was so much in depression mm-hmm. that all I could do was get myself up and my three kids and walk from Paradise Hills down to Tasha job at the Jacob Center. I was mm-hmm. thinking about that, mm-hmm. and I would sit there all day and ask Tasha, "What am I supposed to do?" Wow, so. I was that traumatized, so all, I I couldn't even work. Washed my face. I mm-hmm. washed my face, brushed my teeth, and I literally walked every day from Paradise Hills Man. with my three kids to the Jacob Center. Mm-hmm. And I would sit there all day and ask Tasha, what am I supposed to do? Mm-hmm. I didn't know what to do. Man. Man. I didn't know what to do. I gave up all of my life. Mm-hmm. Gave up in all. Uh, I feel God had failed me. Mm-hmm. I feel I had failed Monique. Mm-hmm. I feel I had failed myself. Mm-hmm. And I feel I had failed my other kids. Mm-hmm. So I felt I had failed so many people. Right. I was kicking myself in the head. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until I think I got a little bit of closure right. when they found one each killer. Right. And I right. Think that's where I was able to start a little bit of okay. my healing mm-hmm. process. You know, it's an ongoing healing process. You right. Know? I'd be a different person, you know. Right. So I feel like I was I was traumatized from that, but in the midst of my of being traumatized from that, you know, like you know, we're talking about kids. I have one son that has mm-hmm. life; he's never mm-hmm. getting out. I have an older son mm-hmm. who just did nine years, and it wasn't until Monique got killed that I looked at my own how I was living and how things I was doing and they weren't the right thing. Right. So that was part of my process on here. Wow. I think once I was able to get over not I still haven't got what happened to Monique. Uh-huh. But once I was able to see myself as I won't say the victim, but mm-hmm. as a person that had lost somebody. Because mm-hmm. when my son was out there terrorizing the streets, mm-hmm. I wasn't a victim. Mm-hmm. I was along cheering them on, tearing their eyes in the streets. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until something happened to my daughter that I realized that it was tragic what happened to my daughter. But I had this son that was out here that was already terrorizing the streets. And I was allowing him to terrorize the streets. So I had to take a, a, a look and say, okay. Now something happened to you, but when your son was out to terrorizing the streets, it was okay from terrorizing the streets. So part of my hearing process was to humble myself and uh, apologize for all the mm. 
things that I had allowed my wow. son to do that I know that I shouldn't allow him wow. to do, you know. Wow. So I had to apologize to the community, to the police officers, to the probation department, to my son, mm -hmm. because I allowed him to do it. Wow. You know, being a good parent of my own self. Right. So right. I was traumatized. Right. You know? Still traumatized, you know. I just try to look at things different. Right. Way, you know, different. You know, um, man, uh, Ms. Swafford, that is powerful. And um, I'm glad you're honest and open about that because uh, what you said, you just hit it right on the head of what I deal with in the community and, and especially when I'm talking with folks and uh, we're we trying to deal with it from all perspective of like you bringing closures, getting the crime solved, helping families and reaching out to the perpetrators and so on. And I, I, I remember me and my son one time got into a little disagreement because I had sent out a video of, of, of a person who killed someone. Uh, and I uh, say, anybody know this person? What You know, report to the police, you know. And I say, hey, what you doing? And, and, and uh, you know, who you send that to? And so on. Oh, well, to my network, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we got into the discussion about, you know, um, uh, we're not detectives, you know, you know, let the, you know, police do their job and we do our job, you know, reaching out to community, which was a good point. But but one of the things that I said was is that, well, you know what? I said, it's it's I said, you know, um uh these parents want the crime to be solved. And he brought out an interesting point which you just addressed. He said, Well, you know what? He said when when that parent's child is out there committing violent acts and whatever they're doing they're not saying anything but then as soon as their child get killed they want to say something like oh we got to solve this crime and it kind of shut me down a little bit because I understood what he was saying and so on about that you know and I knew that that's another piece that need to be addressed and you know just hearing that come from you I mean you looked at it and you addressed it appropriately and was honest and, and humble about it. And a lot of people are not. They, they will never admit. They will never uh, uh, come to the place like, you know what? I failed too because I didn't do anything about it. You know, I knew this was going on and I didn't do anything about it. And so, you know, but as a community, we have to have these kind of conversations. We have to be able to love, forgive, to listen and to love and, and forgive, you know, and, and repent and to turn from that. So really um, appreciate that. And, and um, um, uh, because we need that. We need that. And, and we know that the healing process is going to continue on for you. And um uh, being involved and be able to give back. That's one of the ways of doing it. So here is, 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 is something else. Our youth and young adults, and, 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 and Dr. Heather kind of addressed it a little bit, you know, I don't see them as being violent but are affected by violence. And um, let me just give you an example of that. A lot of times, you know, a person, if they lose a loved one, and when I say, because when we, let's just look at gangs and, like you said, community violence and group violence. Um, a lot of times when, 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 when an individual lose someone, a young person lose someone, even though we might look at it as gang and violence, they're looking at it as like, this is somebody I played in the sandbox with. This is like, you know, somebody close to me, somebody I love and I care about. They lose that loved one. I've seen some, some of the hardest gang bangers when these things happen cry, break down in tears because they have lost someone that they loved. Mm -hmm. And they're hurting. They're traumatized. So it's fight or flight, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't have life skills to be able to uh, have self-control and work through it in a in a um, decent and, and logical way. Uh, so what do they think? Okay, the way I solve this problem is get a gun and go and get the person that did it. And so, but it's because they're not, it's not really that they're fighting. They're not like a terrorist just want to go and kill people and shoot up buildings and whoever they kill and take out before they go out, you know, like that. But it's more so that they have been affected by this violence and so on. So, um, what role does community play in group violence prevention? And we'll begin with you, Dr. <laughs> Well, I think I really agree with that idea that it takes a village. Mm -hmm. it, it, part of um, what happens a lot of times when an act of violence occurs is that we we look for someone to blame. Mm -hmm. 
and we want a quick answer and we want it's it's on this one person or it's on this one group or it's on this this one race or mm -hmm. anything uh, we, we look for an answer because that's the easier way right if there was a quick solution that'd be an easier way but the reality is it's a systemic thing we we have to look at the bigger system okay so if hmm. this person commits a harm what systems are they a part of and not a part of right. that, that need to come around and come together with that individual? Right. What does their educational setting look like? Mm -hmm. What does their community look like? Do they have services? Are there places to go? You know, something in Southeast, there's not really a lot of healthy places for kids to go hang out. Right. Uh, there, right. There's not a movie theater. There's not a bowling alley. There's... So what are we providing for the youth for them to stay busy and have healthy activities to right. do? Right. You know, and and not at the fault of the parents. People have to make money, mm -hmm. you know. So if, mm -hmm. if someone's out working, who is there to provide support for the youth mm -hmm. when they need someone to talk to? So when violence occurs, we really need to come together and look at how can we all be there to support one another and, and what immediate needs mm -hmm. can we help meet and who can provide those supports you mm -hmm. know um the, yes as a mental health professional i can provide therapy but that's therapy alone is not the solution right, we need right, food we right. need jobs wow. we need shelter we need all of this look at that so we need to look at all the big picture wow wow and that that's awesome and i, I think a lot of times we don't look at all of that you know we just look at lock them up you know and i remember when i went to oakland uh looking at their programs that they do in violence prevention and intervention and that was one of the things that the city the city actually has a program there and um they 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 support the, they give funding to community organizations through the tax mm. uh and they also have funding for police and funding for fire and but uh, as first responders but they also have funding for the community and um between uh, the community and uh, the police department, they, they um, divided up, I think, into like about, um, uh, uh, I think the police department gets 60 percent and community get 40 percent. You know, what's remaining, because I think they get about a couple million to fire and then the rest goes between police and um, community. And one of the things that they said was, is that um, you just can't lock them all up. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to solve the problem. Yeah, right. And then on the other end, they're saying you just can't do all community programs. you got to have both. you got to have it all. It has to be a collaborative effort. Mm -hmm. And I think even the police that we work with and other different agencies, they understand that too. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to get folks to understand that and so on. So, uh, Tasha, what, are you, what, what, is, what is your perspective on that when we talk about uh, violence prevention and our youth and, and how they're affected by this violence. You know, a lot of times we just look at them as violent. They're stoned up crazy and all this. But we don't look at, you know, if we talk about the trauma and how they've been affected by it, how do we, you know, yeah. you know I mean, do I this? think that, that we need to also deal with the, the underlying issue of race. Mm -hmm. um, when when you have a group of white boys that mm -hmm. go out and, and do something, um, you know, it, the the justice system is is very different. Right. Um. And we've seen that even recently. Right. Um, you know, in the in the justice system. Uh. And I think that that we we gotta deal with the fact we're all a part of the community. Right. Even these systems that are are embedded, um, over us are part of our community. Right. Um. When and when we look at community, we have to look at community as everything. Right. Um. Everything that works there. Everything mm -hmm. that lives there. Mm -hmm. Um. Everything. Okay. Um, what what worked for me mm -hmm. um, because my kids were able to um, overcome mm -hmm. triumph, mm -hmm. I should say, um, in in many ways. They still have, you know, my my one, <laughs> you know, still still has a a process of decision making to mm -hmm. learn. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's learning. He's still young. You know, yeah. pe people have planted seeds on him where he makes better decisions. Now, mm -hmm. does he fail? We all fail at times. Exactly. We all one. We all one. You know, one bad decision away. That's right. Um, that's right. Yeah, that's and right. Um, you know, so my thing <laughs> is, is that until we really work together, mm -hmm. um, until we start looking at. Um, intervention as we look as at um, locking folks up mm -hmm. um, and I mean in a, in a sense of that we have 
a, a unit of intervention officers mm-hmm. um, within right. probation, right. within the police. And right. I'm not talking about one or two officers. I'm right. talking about like you have a department. Right. Um, until we have a group violence in, prevention and intervention department. Right. Not a commission. Right. You know, right. And, right. I, and I'm right. fine. Don't get right. me wrong. Gang commission mm-hmm. does what the law mm-hmm. says it's supposed to do. Is and, if people, and if people don't know the law, mm-hmm. then they a lot understand. of perceptions are what coming out. Is, yeah. You want to change the gang commission, you change the law. Right. Exactly. You go to the mayor, you have the mayor change the law. Right. The mayor created the gang commission. Mm-hmm. The mayor created those ordinances right. and the mayor can change those exactly. if the people tell him to. Council, um, yeah. And one thing that we need to do is that if we want change, we can't so show up 20 strong. Right. We right. have to show up 2,000 strong, 3,000 strong, 4,000 strong, 10,000 strong. Um, whether we like each other or not, mm-hmm. we have to put some of that aside, aside. to make change right. for our people. Right. Black, brown, white, right. whatever. We have to come, LGBT. Right. We have right. to come together as a people mm-hmm. to, to change the dynamics for us. Right. Um, mm. When we look at the, the, the justice system, the justice system does what it's supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's supposed to judge. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and you, there's going to be biases within that system because there's not many of judges that look like us, mm-hmm. that have come up and have life experiences like us. Right. We need to stop thinking that if we put people with life experience in roles of officer, probation officer, judge, attorney, all these different fields. If we don't put people with life experience in those fields Mm -hmm. more than we have people with just the educational background Mm -hmm. um, and the certificates, uh, (laughs) we're going to keep getting the biases that we get in those systems. Right, right. Um, Because we don't have people. One of the things that that really weighs on me is when somebody says, you know, I understand. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that lived ex- experience, right. you really don't understand. Right. You just have empathy, right? right. You know, but you don't yeah. you don't have a real understanding mm-hmm. of 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 what I grew up with. I mean, right. what, there's a was a young girl here mm-hmm. when I was her age. I was prevented from walking to the store because at that time, 60s had a lot of rivals. Mm -hmm. And I walked to the store one day with a group of friends, and one of the 60s -hmm. was dismembered and put in a bush. Mm -hmm. And and that's what we witnessed. Now, Um, did we know that was a trauma? No, we didn't know that was a trauma, but we knew it prevented us from walking to the liquor store. Like, so... (laughs) Why take the liquor store? (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, those are things... That we grew up with, that we got to change as a whole. We got to change how we deal with trauma. We got to change how we deal with injustices. We got to change how we deal with intervention and prevention Mm -hmm. because we've not been dealing with it correctly. Right. Um, right. Band-Aids is not going to work. Right. So, (laughs) Man, you know, and that's amazing, you know, uh, as a little child to see, you know, to walk down the street. And and, and folks don't really think about all those kind of things, you know, of what we what folks are going through and so on. And, you know, I, I was, I was, um, I Ms. Mean, Swaffer, I was thinking about you, you know, also from the perspective of, of losing, uh, your daughter Monique and then, uh, seeing what happened to your sons. But then, like you said, you had those, your three other little kids that you were raising. So, um, what do you think the community should be doing as a, when you look at it from the lens of a parent and also getting involved in what you experience and what you have to do, what should what role should the community be playing in um, violence prevention, prevent violence from taking place? Yeah, I, I, for me in general, I think that it starts, like she's saying, with the people authority. I think um, mm-hmm. Kevin Faulkner mm-hmm. and the gang commissioner, mm-hmm. Ricky Laster, they need to be held accountable. Mm-hmm. I still have three kids at home. Mm-hmm. It's the summertime. And, and how are your kids? My my daughter just graduated from Lincoln. She's 17. I got a daughter turned 16 today, and my son is 12 years old, and that's at the age that the gang members reach out. Yeah. If it's not for places like the Y, yeah. there is no Y this summer. Mm-hmm. So Kevin Faulkner and Ricky Laster. And the city council. That's right. <laughs> they should have thought of places for us for us in the Southeast community to have mm-hmm. our kids to go. Mm-hmm. So I'm asking, what are my kids supposed to do for the summer? They write the grants, they have the money, they have the solutions. Mm-hmm. So I have to keep my son in mm-hmm. for the summer, but luckily Mr. Brecker is putting him in the uh, the RB All-Star Camp. Uh-huh. So he's leaving on the 7th, he's mm-hmm. going to be gone to the 12th. Mm-hmm. Five days, I know he'll be staying at the university, representing awesome. San Diego. Awesome. But you see what I'm saying? If it's, you know, Jackie Robinson is the only thing that we really have around there, and it's not running. So right. 
he doesn't really have anything to do. Right. You know? So just like right. in the house, oh yeah, yeah, I just feel like it should be more resources for the kids, you know, mm. safe, you know. Yeah. Even like the yeah. Jacob says, that movie night, that's kind of cool. And one of the things that we're trying to do is summer night light program. We're like trying that. to get them to fund it, you know, from Wednesday to Thursday, 7 p.m. to midnight, the whole family come out, food, games, classes, the I whole shebang, like keep them going. I would like to participate that me and my We got to get them to support it, the funding and get it going, but, well, I'll, but I'll, we're working I'll, on it. Whoever needs here, if we need the funding, let's go. The man, the city council. <laughs> man, city council. I'll be knocking at your door next week. <laughs> Tasha. I mean, and also, I want I want to say oh. that. Um, hey, excuse me. And what happened to the Boys and Girls Club? When I was growing up back in the 70s, everybody used to go down to the Boys and Girls Club because I went to Morris High School. So, like I'm saying, the Boys and Girls Clubs and the Jackie Robinson YMCA's, that's all the kids basically have, you know. Okay, Tasha. I want to say that um, as a people, We've lost our place. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. When we look at the structure of government, mm -hmm. the people sit up top, mm -hmm. um, and and we constantly have this um, environment in many communities mm -hmm. where we're on the bottom. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, representatives uh, like Mayor Faulkner and all these others. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, city council um, and people in the county and the city mm -hmm. um, that are working. These are representatives right. of the sovereign people. Right. Um, which means they are servants too. Right. And we take the position that we are servants to them. Right. And I think we need to change that. Um, we, the people, are the reason why they are the representatives. And right. they need to represent us as a whole, mm -hmm. not just some of us. I mean, you look at how things happen north of eight, um, and there's changes that can be made automatically, sure. but... The changes don't happen like that in Southeast. Okay. So, so Dr. Heather, before we close, we have about two minutes left, and I want, want to uh, hear from you in, in this regard. What can we do as a community, and what role do we play in violence prevention? Well, I think um, both my peers here have <laughs> said it quite well, that a big part of violence prevention is putting things into place that youth and individuals can do that are healthy and safe and fun activities. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to sit around and do nothing. Right. The, nobody wants to do that. Some are nice lights. <laughs> there has to be something to do. And I think another piece mm -hmm. of this, too, is really um, teaching empathy. Right. I right. think, um, you know, this could start in the schools. It starts in youth programs. It starts at home in the family and Education. teaching empathy. Yeah. Because if, if we can truly feel empathy for another being, right. it's really hard to commit an act of harm against yeah. them. Right. That's right. So right. I really think that's another great place to start. And spiritually. If right. a person is spiritually fit and, and feels that empathy, that's a, that's a spiritual feeling. Right. Well, uh, we, we want to thank you, uh, Ms. Tasha Williamson and uh, Ms. Tracy Swafford and Dr. Hale Heather. <laughs> Thank you for this being on the show. show. You know, <laughs> the relish thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I uh, want to thank you for being on the show. Uh, it was it was uh, great to have you. Great discussion, and uh, we hope that our listeners are listening. So the community got to come together, and we got to work together to prevent violence, to intervene, and build a healthy community. So stay, uh, come on and visit us next week and uh, tune in to What's Happening Now on KBLK Radio every Sunday at 9 a.m. May God bless you, and we hope you tune in next week.